uh, coming to this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about checking your work, Linux kernel testing, and CI. Um, I work at Meta. My name is David, for those of you I haven't met before. And so we've chatted about testing. Oh, oh thank you. So he's in French? Yeah, yeah. I have an excuse. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've, we've had at least one talk about testing. Guillaume spoke um, uh, earlier in the conference about tagging kernel releases on stable branches with CI runs. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple things that, were, that are the same. There's a little bit of overlap, but this is really more focusing on how to test the kernel, what we do to validate the kernel, like what are all of the different ways that we run CI in the community. And all is in quotes because there's like a lot, and I'm sure that I missed some of them. Uh, going to talk about how tests are written. Uh, we're also going to talk about how they run in CI, like I said. Um, what I think we can do to improve the current situation, um, a Q&A session. And then if we have time at the end, I wrote like a tutorial on how to write uh, self-tests. So if that's something that people would find interesting, we can chat about that as well. So to get started, just a couple of disclaimers. First of all, um, like I said, I may be missing details of tools that I'm not aware of or left out because uh, there's like a lot out there and we only have 40 minutes. Um, also, uh, add as far as I know before everything I say because I'm sure that I missed some stuff. And if I did, feel free to grab the mic and interject. Also, this presentation was done in the middle of the night over the Atlantic. I didn't know that I was going to pre be presenting until Sunday. So please, no tomatoes. Uh, if you want to throw tomatoes at somebody, Jens is right there. He's the one that uh, hooked me up. So uh, yeah, with that out of the way, we can get started. So let's first talk about how kernel tests are written. Um, so there are a lot of ways you can add tests to the kernel. There's case self-tests, uh, which is more of an end-to-end -end testing framework that lives in the tree. KUnit, uh, XFS tests, we're going to go over these in more detail. This is just an overview of some of the ways that you can add tests to the kernel. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of options. That's a good thing because there's a lot of options. It's also kind of a bad thing because it's a lot and it's hard to know where to start. So hopefully we can clarify that a little bit today. So case self-tests are the first one I want to talk about. Um, those are more end-to-end -end tests uh, uh, in the kernel. Um, so they're instances of user space programs, uh, which means that, like I said, they're more end-to-end. -end. Um, going back to Michael's talk, uh, this, these are great because it allows you to test your APIs. It allows you to really validate how the kernel is supposed to behave from the perspective of users, which, as we know, uh, as Linux developers, is the most important thing. Um, they're usually written in C because uh, we're C programmers for the most part, but they only need to be executable. So certain tests like RCU, uh, their test case is just a script that invokes another script which loads a kernel module and then does a whole bunch of really complicated stuff in ring zero. Um, other other uh, uh, test suites like C groups actually do stuff in user space and validate that the behavior that we expect from the mem controller and the, the CPU controller and stuff are, uh, are what they should be. And these, these are all located in uh, tools testing self-tests in the suite. So I'll just give you an example of, of what a test case looks like. Um, that's really hard to see, isn't it? Uh, OK, well, we'll go through it quickly. Uh, basically, this live patch uh, test is just testing that we can, live, we can load live patches. So we load a module here, a live patch. Uh, kernel, kernel live patch is just an instance of a module with special flags. And then we go down, we validate that the output in D message is what we expect. Um, yeah, so I won't go through, I won't go through any more, and there's obviously more to the test case I didn't include, but just a bash script that also has other helper stuff like kernel modules that, that are involved. Um, this is an instance of how we run self-tests. So uh, I skipped the make step, which I'll show at the end of the, the presentation if we have time. But you build it, and then you issue this run case self-test, which looks at this file, which has the suite that you're going to run, and then the name of the executable. And then it runs it and outputs it in a tap format, which is um, a format that we've agreed on for, for running kernel tests. There's another format called KTAP, which I think is also under discussion, but TAP is still the, the official format. And so if you're, if you're writing a parser or something like that to figure out if the test ran correctly, um, you know, TAP format is what you want to do. OK, so moving on, we also have KUnit tests. Um, as you probably guessed, this is more of a unit testing framework. And so unlike self-tests, where you're compiling a user space program, you're calling system calls, you're issuing ioctals, loading modules, whatever, um, this code is actually compiled directly into the kernel. And so the idea is that you link against symbols in the kernel, um, and then K, uh, KUnit gives you APIs that let you assert uh, 
um, what you expect from calling those functions. Uh, so you obviously specify whether or not you want to include that code with kconfig like any other um, object file in the kernel that you're, that you're building. Um, and yeah, it's a test of, uh, unit testing. Also small uh, font, so I'm sorry about that, but as you can see, they have kunit assertions. You actually call uh, symbols that are directly uh, part of the, the kernel. This code lives with, the, with the, the code that it's testing, so usually there's like a test.c file with the subsystem. Um, obviously, the functions that you're looking against have to be non-static unless you're adding the test cases in the file. Um, but yeah, this is this is useful and it's 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 been around for a while, very stable. Um, this is what it looks like when you run kunit. So there's this this uh, Python script in the testing uh, kunit subdirectory. You run it, it builds the kernel for you, runs it in KVM, and then gives you this pretty nice output uh, for all the unit tests. And you can specify like which test suite you want and stuff like that. Um, I guess there's a there's an issue that somebody needs to fix um, in the the UM uh, arch, arch logic where we actually invoke the syscall, but you guys uh, you know anybody that wants impact can take care of that. Um, so moving on, we have XFS tests. Uh, these are the file these are the tests that the file systems use to validate. Um, so yeah, like I said, they're all for the file systems. They have common logic for what you'd expect for testing a file system, like bootstrapping the block devices that they're going to use. Um, there's some handy stuff like you can specify whether uh, a test is shared between a subset of the file systems, it's global, it's just for one, um, and it's located in a separate repository. Um, so there's a couple more that I want to go over really quickly. Linux kernel performance, Pharonix, Linux, Linux test project. Um, you may have heard of some of these. They're obviously uh, really great resources even though they're not kind of like part of the tree and part of the sort of like, you know, yeah, the common sort of like ordained tests that we, that we actually go through the upstream review process to, uh, to include. Um, but they're also useful and uh, these are run on some of the CI solutions that we're going to see. Um, so I want to talk about how the tests are run, but I also just want to quickly comment that it's a little bit crazy to me that we have like all these different solutions for kind of accomplishing the same thing. And we'll talk about that more at the end. But um, for me, when I, was, when I was a newcomer to the Linux kernel, I was trying to figure out how I should test stuff. And I thought, you know, I saw, okay, XFS tests and KUnit and, and uh, K self test. And then I also obviously knew about Pharonix and these other, these other resources. And um, one thing that we may want to consider doing at some point is, is having uh, like a well-defined, you know, way for how to add tests and like where should you be adding tests? Where does the, com what does the community consider to be the official tests and the tests that, uh, you know, that we, that we use to determine really if we're writing stable code or not? And so we'll talk about that more um, a little bit later. But for now, just keep that in the back of your minds um, because I think it's, uh, it's something that's important. Um, so moving on, we can talk about how to actually run all these tests that we spend time writing. Uh, just like with writing the tests, there's a million ways to do this too. Um, we have kernel CI, which is what Guillaume was talking about earlier in the, uh, earlier in the, the conference. This is part of the uh, Linux Foundation. Um, really great tool, which we'll look at more closely. We have um, Linux kernel performance, or the kernel test robot, which I'm sure all of us have at one point or another um, gotten dinged by, helpfully. Uh, so this is part of Intel. They have a zero day team, which is called zero day because they're trying to tell you within one day whether you've broken something. Uh, we have patchwork, which I'm sure a lot of the maintainers in the room use. Um, I know that Steve does because he showed me it when I was at LSFMM. <laughs> um, we use so the BPF team uh, at, at Meta and um, the networking folks there as well use this for, uh, for, for running CI, as we'll see. Sysbot, part of Google, uh, fuzzes the kernel. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that as well. Um, and then we also have maintainers, private machines, um, slash basements, like uh, Joseph Bassick, who's the ButterFS maintainer, uh, where they, they have their own setup and um, their own way of, of uh, showing results and, and um, keeping track of how their subsystems are doing. And then uh, Thorsten also, um, I should have mentioned before as well, but Thorsten also talked about uh, RegSpot, which uh, is an issue tracker, and itself is, uh, we're trying to figure out if, if how that could be used as well to, to track problems in the kernel. So let's start with kernel CI. Um, like I said, uh, Linux Foundation project, um, it's all open source. Uh, it builds and tests kernels like across the whole, tons of trees, tons of branches, lots of tool chains, lots of configs, lots of architectures, lots of SOCs. And one thing that I want to kind of drive home here is that it's really hard to test the kernel because uh, 
it's so there's so many ways to build it. You know, we can build it with Clang, GCC, all these different versions of both. Uh, you can build it for MIPS, Spark, uh, S390X, um, various configs for all of those architectures. It's a lot of cognitive load, I think, as a developer to know how to really have faith in your patch, depending on what you're doing, if, if you really want to make sure you haven't broken something for these architectures and all these configs, especially if you're adding it to core, um, core common code. So uh, yeah, you know, a good CI framework, I think, has to sort of take care of that and, and take the burden on for the developer. So as we go through the rest of these projects, um, let's keep that in mind and you know, we, we should try to think of how we can, we can address these pain points. Um, so here's just an example of what kernel CI looks like, the web UI. Um, this shows all the jobs that are run for various trees and branches. Uh, as you can see, it tells you which builds are passing, or at least the number of builds, um, which are skipped, which are failing, and same for the tests when it ran. And so there's a lot of information here. Um, I'm going to go through it kind of quickly because, yeah, we could spend all day, but you could also just go to the website. So um, let's not waste our time. Yeah, so but let's start with the main line, the first one at the top there. Um, like I said, this is the main line, main line uh, tree master branch. Obviously, this should always be stable. Um, and if we go into here, we see that uh, this is, these are all the different commits that we're testing for. Um, if we click into this kernel, it shows us some useful information, uh, like all the tests that were run for it. You can take us to the git URL for the, for the repo, um, the, the, the commit hash, all that fun stuff. Um, and then if we, uh, we want to open up the tests, we can see what the logs were, D message logs. Uh, we can get the kernel image, so it's easy to reproduce the failures that we observe. Um, so yeah, you know, it's very useful. Uh, if you get pinged and you say, hey, you broke something, I don't know about you, but it's kind of a pain, in my opinion, to have to build for, uh, figure out what the configs were, um, you know, get the right tool chain, do all that stuff. It's, uh, it's a huge pain. So kernel CI does a really good job making, making this easier and uh, more accessible. Um, and then also, you know, other useful stuff. It takes you right to the, uh, to the commit, commit hash on, um, on kernel.org. Um, yep, so it's good stuff. Uh, this is an example of a build failure that it tells you. Um, lots of information, obviously. Again, the, the, the config, the build logs, um, the kernel image, all this great stuff. And here's just an example of uh, the output for why this one failed. And it was because we were trying to build modules. We didn't have the right flag for this config option. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just there's so many things to keep in mind. It's, having tools like this are, are super useful and uh, one of the great things about the Linux community. OK, cool. Um, so going on, yeah, there's a test page. I know we don't want to spend too much time on this. And then this is a list of all the SOCs that they run as well. So the pros and the cons, um, I think there's a ton of pros for kernel CI. It's a really great tool. Uh, it does all the things that you don't want to have to think about as a developer. Um, builds for multiple architectures, multiple tool chains, like I said. Um, it does email failures to the upstream list. I actually originally had the slide saying it didn't, and that was a con because I had never seen it. But that's because the branches that I work on don't use kernel CI yet. Um, but it does do that, and it also bisects changes. I didn't know that, but, but uh, Guillaume helpfully saved me before I came up here. But then, you know, it's okay. I'll just I'll out myself anyways. Um, it doesn't run on, um, on patches that haven't been merged to trees yet, but they are working on, uh, on adding the ability for, for subsystems to use their APIs to set up the workflow that work for them. So for example, for BPF, we run with patchwork, but there are APIs that are coming to kernel CI that would let us, for example, um, uh, run callbacks when new patches are posted, tell kernel CI which configs we want to build for, which architectures, which SOCs we want to run on. Um, so uh, they're getting more capabilities. And um, Guillaume told me to add this one. The web dashboard needs some redesign and still is bugged. So I wasn't trying to dunk on him. He, uh, he asked me to add that. But it does work really well. If you go there now, I didn't run into almost any issues. The only one that I had actually noticed is that the Ajax calls don't work here. But um, you know, usually you don't really care about the number unless it's non-zero for the failures anyways. So OK, cool. Um, let's move on to Linux kernel performance. Like I said, this is an, uh, an Intel tool. Uh, it also builds and runs across a variety of trees, branches, tool chains, configs, but it also includes unmerged patches. Um, so that's very useful. Uh, runs all sorts of tests, build tests, benchmark, logical tests. Um, these are all defined in a separate GitHub repo, although it also does run K self tests, as I, as I found out. Um, and I thought that it only built and ran tests for x86, but Greg helpfully corrected me that apparently it also does run builds for other architectures. But uh, apparently, you have to email them privately for that to happen, because 
when I was at LSFMM, there were other maintainers that wished that were telling me that this is a huge gap, and they wish that Intel did this. So, um, if you're a maintainer, keep that in mind. You may want to reach out to the zero day team to get their help with other architectures. And just to you know prove why I thought that was the case, it's because their website says that they only run on Intel architecture. Anyways, uh, so moving on, this is what their dashboard looks like. Um, they list all the different jobs that they run um, with some helpful descriptions. Uh, if you go to that page, it lists the discussions on the list. I found it a little bit harder to find um, the relevant failures for specific branches and trees, like in kernel CI. But the nice thing about, um, about uh, zero day is it shows you the upstream conversations. And so, for example, um, here's, an, here's an example of a, a build regression uh, that it posted to the list. And here's similarly an example of uh, a, a runtime regression, um, a performance regression for NetPerf. And I don't, yeah, I, I didn't include um, screenshots, but there were all the discussions that take place around this are included, which is, which is really nice. So um, yeah, definitely take a look at that as a, as a resource. Um, pros and cons for this. Uh, it builds on patches that haven't been merged yet, which is a huge plus uh, in my book. Um, it sends mess messages to the upstream lists. Uh, also, you know, it's important to insert yourself into the conversation during the review process, I think. Sorry. Um, so, you know, whatever CI, whatever CI tool you end up using or whatever CI tools we continue to build and improve on, I think this is a really important one to have. Um, I'll talk about this more a little bit later in the presentation, but with with something like this where it's inserting itself into the conversation and interrupting people, I also think it's important for us to think about how to make sure that we don't spam the list and make things noisy. Um, super bad build reg uh, performance regressions and build regressions I think are both instances of tests where it's like unequivocally, yes, you should interrupt people. You should not merge something if there's a build regression and the build doesn't work. But if you have tests that are flaky and, you know, uh, Maybe, maybe uh, you know, we, we should rethink that, or the or the, the maintainers for the subsystem should be the ones that, that dictate how that should work. Um, but moving on, yeah, it runs benchmarks, does bisections, and it supposedly doesn't run on tests for uh, on other architectures according to them, but according to other people, it does. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, another great resource. I mean, a really important part of the community um, and lives alongside kernel CI. So moving on, um, this is what patchwork looks like. I think I might have misordered a slide, but this is what patchwork looks like. Uh, really commonly used by maintainers, like I said. It's a really nice way to see which patches have been sent to your list, see the discussions that have taken place. Um, so unlike something like kernel CI, where it's, uh, it's really more about what, how did the run, like, how, how, what's the stability of the trees, what are the stability of the branches, I would say that patchwork is a little bit more about what's the current discussion and what's you know what's the state of of uh, yeah of discussions around around your trees and around your branches, um, yeah. And so it's it's a, it's a free web based uh, patch tracking system. Um, we use it at Meta for running BPF tests and some net tests, like I mentioned. The architecture for doing that for running those tests is a combination of uh, of private Meta infrastructure, GitHub, and patchwork itself. And um, we run all of our, the BPF self-tests um, that are listed there in tools testing self-test BPF on several different configs for every patch that's sent to, uh, to some, some BPF lists. So here's an example of the BPF um, page, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, what is it called again, NetDev BPF, yeah. Um, so it's great, it lists all the patches that have been sent. Uh, it also includes the patch series, which is very useful. And then here it says uh, it has the build information. And so one thing I do want to point out is that unlike in kernel CI for the jobs that we were looking at, there are actually jobs on this page that, that have only passing. Um, and we're going to talk about this in the what we can improve section, but I think it's important for CI for us to start to maybe push our, our mental approach to testing, or rather our philosophy of testing, to assuming that a test should pass by default and skip if it, should, if it isn't expected to pass. Um, it's a lot easier, I think, to interpret uh, the stability of a branch or of a build if you if you don't have to keep the cognitive load of knowing that a test is supposed to fail. But um, anyways, we can discuss that more. But for now, let's take a closer look at um, the architecture for Patchwork. So like I said, uh, it's a combination of meta infrastructure, a daemon, and GitHub. Uh, on the Patchwork side here, on, on the left side here with Patchwork, uh, that's where the, the diffs and the patches come into. This daemon runs on meta infrastructure and queries patchwork for, for new patches. When it sees one, it, um, 
It calls out to GitHub to create a new PR, which triggers some GitHub actions, which run uh, builds for the different configurations we want, and then ultimately run the self-test that we want to run. Uh, the daemon then uh, gets those results from GitHub, pushes them up to patchwork, and you have this sort of like back and forth uh, architecture there. And that's when, um, that's when you get this, this view. So if we want to look at what that looks like, uh, we have, um, again, the, the, the run status here on the right. Uh, we can click into this. It shows us all the different jobs that were run, which ones passed, and then which ones failed. In this case, it was kind of a, I wouldn't call it a benign failure, but it wasn't like a horrendous failure where uh, everything is broken, but rather you just didn't include the correct people on the patch, um, which I actually think is still a super important thing to notify people of because uh, that's something that obviously check patch can't catch. And um, it's something that probably the maintainer will tell you to fix if you don't include the right people anyways. So it's a nice way to save, save everybody's time if you notice that. Um, and then if you click through, the summary just says CC maintainer has failed. So Patchwork does have really great, a great UI and great information, but it doesn't really have the same you know, comprehensive uh, information that, that accompanies a failure like you have with, um, with kernel CI. Uh, so maybe something to improve there. So for pros, uh, nice UI, like I said, runs on every patch sent to the, sent to the list that we care about, um, runs on several architectures, so we could add more if we wanted to. Um, speaking about BPF tests in particular, uh, they are deterministic and they're supposed to always pass and they're fast. So this is something you could run locally and have some confidence that it's correct. And if you see it pass on CI, then you should have a lot of confidence that what you're, it's passing like you wanted it to. Um, the con is that it's, it takes a lot of legwork to actually use Patchwork because uh, we, we're using this, this daemon and meta infrastructure to query Patchwork, use GitHub, and then throw it back. If you want to do the same thing, you have to write your own daemon and uh, write your own in GitHub integrations. The, um, if we go back quickly, actually, we do have a repo where we, you can see what GitHub actions we use. It's all public. But it, it's not like a plug and play kind of thing where you like add a you know, you add your tree and branch and maybe some other stuff to a file and it all, it all just works. It does take, it does take some investment um, by, by developers and by maintainers to use, which is something that I definitely think we want to, want to avoid. Um, okay, and so let's just quickly go over a few more. Sysbot, uh, this is the Google fuzzer. Um, really useful, uh, finds a tons, of, tons of bugs, also has some nice pros like it bisects, runs on multiple architectures. This is what it looks like if you go to the dashboard. And then if you want to look at a failure, you can go to the failure and it tells you exactly where, um, what, what, what the, uh, the sanitizer is that failed or what the, what, what the issue was with the fuzzer. And you can uh, reproduce. So also a great resource. Um, and then it also, yeah, it uh, link, links you to Vigor if you need to and, and it sends the emails to the, uh, to the upstream list. Um, pros are it's super useful. Uh, to me, the biggest con is that it um, it doesn't really run tests that contribute that, that developers and maintainers are adding. Uh, again, doesn't mean it's not useful, but it's it's a uh, it's a bit harder to sort of quantify or, or qualify exactly how they should be used, how they should be interpreted when we're talking about the stability of the branches that we're that we're working with. Um, okay, and then there's also the independently managed solutions such as Joseph's Basement. ButterFS, uh, this is super useful. It runs XFS tests for ButterFS. Um, this is what the dashboard looks like. If you want to go look at a failure, you can go click on the link. Um, similarly, uh, it has performance tests as well. So if you want to go to the performance page, it shows you for these different workloads um, what the, uh, what the, whether it passed or failed. Obviously, we have to look at the code to know what that means. But it still has it has numbers and, and you can you can use this to see how ButterFS is comparing or is performing. Excuse me. Um, so even though this is like a homegrown solution, it's really it's interesting that this isn't like it's a different approach to measuring the stability of your of your subsystem. You know, like you can run performance benchmarks and say, okay, like I know exactly this is this is performing well. It passed the test that I wrote. But it's it's also really useful, I think, to have um, an approach where you you just show what the actual performance is for the for the various workloads that you're running. So, um, yeah, you know, it doesn't run on like tons of architectures and tons of configs like kernel CI does. So it, it has that deficiency, but uh, it has its own its own uh, you, you know utility as well. Um, and yeah, pros and pros and cons that we talked about. Uh, obviously, the, I think the, I would argue that the really big con here is the fact that maintainers would have to build this all out themselves and then host it and 
Um, the pro of that is that you get to do exactly what you want, but the con is that it takes work and you don't get the coverage that you get from the, uh, the bigger CI tools. Okay, so that is like a uh, hundred foot view of some of the tools that we have, hundred foot non-exhaustive view of some of the tools that we have. Um, I want to talk a little bit more now on the subjective side of what I think we could do better, even though I touched on it a little bit. Um, please interrupt or interject if you have thoughts here. Uh, we'll have, we have the Q&A at the end, but um, there's, you know, there's really no one right answer to any of these questions. So the more people that get involved, I think the more uh, consensus we'll get to. So let's start by talking about CI. Um, I think the, the sort of obvious point is that a lot of these systems are really kind of trying to do the same thing. They're running builds, they're running tests, they're running it on multiple configs, they're running it on multiple architectures, and they all want to have a green column that tell you your thing is passing, or a red column that tells you don't merge this, this is not ready to be merged yet. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think the obvious point is that what should we try to combine? You know, um, every, like, there are certain features I think that are universally useful for CI, like bisecting patches, emailing the list, um, so if we could maybe think of a way to pull that into shared code or, or uh, figure out um, if there's one resource that does one thing and somebody else that does something else better, like even going back to, to Joseph's setup with ButterFS, like it really is suited well for ButterFS and it, it, could, you know, it could certainly benefit from patch by section, but at least it's something different. But um, the, the, the sort of redundancy here I think is maybe an opportunity to improve things a little bit. Um, and then also, uh, we'll talk about this more with, with the testing as well, but um, I didn't include this in a bullet point, but it's, it's, non, it's not obvious and non-trivial to get your tests integrated with the CI systems as well. Um, if you go, first of all, you have to know what they are, um, and there's a lot of them to choose from, but second of all, you have to be submitting PRs to the CI systems to tell it, hey, you should run my, you should run my self-test suite, you should run my K-unit suite, you should run my out-of-tree out of tests, um, and so I think it begs the question of like, is there a way for us to, as contributors primarily to the kernel tree, give a signal to the CI systems that, that they can parse and consume and, um, and understand how you want your tests to be run instead of you having to tell them exactly what it is for each solution to CI. So yeah, let's talk about the tests on that note. Um, K self test specifically, it's awesome, but it definitely has room for improvement. Uh, it was originally intended to be a place where maintainers and developers could throw tests that would otherwise bit rot if it wasn't in the tree, um, which unfortunately is, doesn't mean that it doesn't bit rot because that does happen if it's not run in CI, but uh, that's what it was for. It wasn't supposed to be you know, like, a, like a metric or a marker of stability. It was just a place where you put your tests and maybe people can use it. No, no guarantees that it's gonna continue to work after, after you land it. And I have some evidence to that point. Um, the, the patch that first added case self-test said it was used to avoid uh, letting the test rust in peace, which is a great saying that I had never heard before. Um, but that was the original purpose. And I think now we have to, we have to evolve case self-test a little bit. Um, I think in, one of the big things is that, uh, one of the great things about case self-test is that it's a very open-ended framework. It's running user space programs, that could be as simple as you know verifying the output of some proc uh, proc file, or it could be as complicated as doing what um, what RCU does and loading uh, loading a kernel module that does tons of stuff. Um, and so I think it's up to the maintain. It has to be up to the maintainers um, and the subsystems that are under test by these these uh, that are under test in the test suite and case self test to know what it's supposed to do and what the expectations are. So for example, it seems like it would be useful as a maintainer to be able to say, okay, I have a test suite. Um, this test is testing a really well-known stable feature. It should never fail. It should be run on every patch. It's fast. Run this, please, on every patch. This test case is new. It's, it's, it only, it's only supported in x86. Don't run it on Spark. Um, and uh, it also takes a long time, so only run it on Nightly. Um, that kind of expressive uh, testing suite, testing, testing uh, approach seems like it would be very useful because then the CI systems could just read those configurations and decide how you want your, like decide how to, how to test for you, right? And give you all the coverage of multiple configs and architectures and stuff. And all you would have to do is just uh, advertise what you can, what your subsystem is, is able to support. Um, so that's that for case self tests. Obviously another really important thing is to add more tests. Um, I, I didn't add like a count of how many test cases or anything are in self tests, 
it's a good number, but it certainly could be more. Um, for example, I added the first test for, for uh, CPU controllers for C groups pretty recently. Um, that's definitely not a new feature, uh, even though it was C groups V2. So if, if you want to get coverage, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, if you want to get impact, I should say, there's a lot of opportunity to get coverage um, uh, by adding tests. And so I, I highly recommend anybody who's interested, especially people that are maybe newer to the community and, and want to get used to the upstream process. This is a really, a really great way to do that and also learn about the systems that you're, that you're testing. Um, another thing I want to talk about is, so this one I really don't have a strong opinion on, and I, I think there's a, there's a lot of pros and cons to this. But for out-of-tree tests, um, you know, going back to Guillaume's discussion about, about kernel CI, it's going to inform, assuming we go with it, which is, it was pretty positive, it was pretty well received, so I assume we will. If we're going to use a kernel CI run to inform the stability of, of a, a stable branch and we do a release, that's great. But how do we know which tests really should be part of that CI run? Like that's, a, that's like a pretty important stamp, right? Like this is actually good enough for the world to use. It's a stable branch, it's good enough for the world to use. So kernel CI, one approach is that kernel CI could be the one that decides that, you know, um, LTP tests and, uh, and uh, those zero-day tests and self-tests and K-unit tests are what we decide are the ones. Or we could have subsystem maintainers take ownership of the stability for their subsystems and go to this configuration idea that, that, I, that I had mentioned. Um, but, you know, there's pros and cons. Uh, there's like tons and tons of tests that aren't included in the tree that are really, really useful, like I said. So something for us to keep in mind as we shift towards a more you know, testing-centric model with having tests uh, be, be part of releases, but um, maybe also not, not the end of the world to, to have tests included out of tree. I would be curious to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Um, okay, and so what do we need to avoid doing while we're improving? The biggest thing is annoying maintainers, I would say. Um, going back to what I was talking about before, uh, I mean, maintainers, from, from, I'm not a maintainer, so I, this is me um, conjecturing, but I think they really like kernel test robot. Like, if, if you're, you have a million patches that you have to review, you know, um, a lot of your time is spent every day reviewing these patches. Uh, like we talked about during, during Dave's talk, um, you know, it's a lot of pressure, and when kernel test robot comes and lands and says this build is broken, you can just throw it in the circular file the person is going to have to send, the contributor that sent the patch is going to have to send a follow-on version, and there's no reason for you to spend your time reviewing it if you know that it's going to, it's going to have to change. Um, so I think that's a really valuable part of the upstream process that we have, and I don't think we want to regress on that by having robots send messages to the list for tests that actually aren't blocking anything or for failures that aren't blocking anything. Um, yeah, that would suck, so let's not do that. Um, and to the point, to that point, not all tests are created equal. Build tests are always going to be a really strong signal that we shouldn't merge something unless the build system is broken, but that wouldn't get in because otherwise uh, you wouldn't, the build would have failed. Um, yeah, but for other test runs, it's less clear, and I think having, um, having the decision of what constitutes passing flaky, stable, et cetera, really should be up to the maintainers because at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones that are getting these messages and... Um, you know, we, the, if you're working on a subsystem, you know best as to really what state it's in and, and, and uh, what kind of signal you want from the test that you've written for it. All right, um, so that was all that I had other than that, uh, the bonus round of how to write a K-self test. So before we talk about that, I just wanted to open it up and, and see, what you, see what you thought. I want to extend your um, discussion a bit more in the area of embedded systems because over there um, a lot of the concepts don't apply as neatly. The problems often device drivers, well you can test that they build but running end-to-end -end tests for these kind of embedded device drivers is often very hard. Mm -hmm. um, it requires special hardware setups where, which are not trivial to drive because you have many components that have to talk to each other. Um, so I think in this area having the tests in tree is infeasible because they are so tied to the specific hardware setup they need to run on. Hmm. Uh, one thing I was thinking about in that area is maybe we can have an upstream API to something like kernel CI where people can then hook in their custom tests um, and of course it needs to be approved but then they could have their own setups for certain devices and provide end-to-end -end testing of these drivers. 
That's a really good point. Um, I, so, so kernel CI does have uh, tons of APIs already. They're, they're redesigning all of them now, but I think that is an intention um, eventually. So that's a fair point. It's there already. You want to throw the mic up? <laughs> just um, that that feature is there already. Um, so um, kernel CI, um, uh, like David said, it's an um, API based. Um, the set there's um, the uh, kernel CI will do, will do a bunch of builds, uh, put them on the servers, uh, but then the uh, and then it will run some tests itself. But those tests go into the database through an API, and we already take tests that other people run that we didn't schedule at all. Um, so if, if you've got some custom lab with some custom tests, you can absolutely Sorry. just start submitting data to kernel CI now if you talk to us and get an API key and write the appropriate integrations. Are those, do those tests include tests that aren't in the, in the kernel CI Repo because I think yeah you're, you're okay because your your hardware is in your like local local yeah you know, we, uh, we'll it, it, the, like the, the name of the test is basically a, it's slightly more involved but it's basically a string mm -hmm. so we, we don't care what the test is okay so you mentioned kernel CI does the build and throws you the image over the wall and you have to test it or yeah. okay well the problem is. That works when you have a platform that's entirely mainlined, but when it isn't and you need custom stuff to <laughs> get the environment up and running, then this is hard. Um, so I think in these situations it would be better to have something that triggers your own setup to build the kernel image and you just provide the results back in a standardized format. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if we want to include that as like blockers for the stable branches and stuff like that, though, right? Like, if you're building something, drivers or anything like that, that's not, that's not in the mainline tree. I mean, it seems useful for sure to have, and maybe it's something yeah. they can provide. The, the problem is when you have a platform that's very close to mainline, but not quite, and you have a few things you have to tweak before it mainline runs. But that's like a tainted kernel at that point, almost, right? I mean, it's, it's close, but yeah. Yeah. But uh, for some platforms, otherwise you can't get test coverage for certain drivers which are mainline. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly would, would be useful to very it, least. It's a messy idea. thing, I know, but yeah. um, so I, that's I, where I see the problem. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say, what about putting as, as many as possible tests in the kernel tree? Like, uh, of course, if the test can be run on any machine or like standard setups like uh, this and this and this architecture. Of course, it should be run in CI, but even as, as the gentleman was saying about embedded systems, uh, we can make something like the test submitted in the, in the tree. A and then if you don't have the setup, of course, uh, like it won't run on CI, but at least the source is there. Like, yeah. like enforce this, uh, the change, if uh, the new interface, new driver, new feature, along with the tests. Like I'm, I'm a fan of this approach. Like all together. So th that's a good point. And so unfortunately, K self test now, you only advertise what configs you need to run, but you don't have any way to advertise what configs you don't support. So like live patch, I don't think it's running on like MIPS or all the every architecture yet for an example, as, ex as an example, but um, it would, it wouldn't, it would try if you tried to build on MIPS and run the live patch test. So I think to your point, it would be useful to be able to say, here's my test suite. Um, I don't support any of this stuff yet, or, you know, I support this config option that hasn't even been merged yet, and I couldn't build with it. So, yeah, I, mean, I guess that I guess it depends on whether your intention is to try to get it upstream soon, and this is a way to sort of like grease the wheels. But I think I tend to agree that the more tests that are at least in source, even if they can't run yet, at least we can see how has been tested this code. At least. Yeah, 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 exactly. We and can reason about TDD, right? I mean, I know that it's weird to say that for the kernel yeah. community, but yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's useful. Think behind you. You, you, you can say what config options you depend on, which tends to cope with a lot of it. What you can't say at the minute in case self test is things like I need a an SSD to run this on or something like that. That's who, yeah. That that's uh, that's more complicated. But you, you can't say what you don't support, right? Because you can only there's only the yeah, config you, you, file. You, yeah. yeah, you can't you you can't conflict with anything. But because our APIs are stable and whatnot, that's never a problem, right? <laughs> Oh, Michael already left, so yeah. <laughs> he's not here to hear that one, unfortunately. So other people too. For those that like to, or would be really useful if you want to be a kernel developer, you're a debuggy, or you know, people find bugs and such like that. 
where you submit a bug, submit a reproducer, if you have a re especially if you have a reproducer, add that to a case self-test. That's a lot of the stuff that I've added in my test suite, so usually from bugs, if I have a reproducer, I make sure that that regression doesn't happen again. So a lot of times bugs are the best things to, or if you have a reproducer, those are like the best things to add to your test suite, just to let you know, so help us. I think that that's a really good point, and I think maybe uh, an elephant in the room is that that's very common practice in a lot of other other communities too. So it's a uh, not every subsystem should be the same or has to be the same. We don't have to do the same things, but it seems like good practice if you if you notice a regression and you fix it, add a test for it for sure. Yeah. So I'll just add to that, if you have some seriously obscure hardware which is upstream, and you find a bug and fix it, how do you add it to self tests? Say a touch controller or whatever. You're talking about like if you have a, bu a bug that's only for a specific hardware, but say if the, what, how you triggered it is something that all hardware uses, you should still add it because there might be another hardware that triggers on it. So as long as the interface that you're doing, if it's specific to a specific device that only will happen there, yeah, you can't do anything. That's, that's the problem that we were discussing already that's very hard to do. What I'm saying is if there's something that only happens on one hardware, I, this is why I keep old hardware. I used to have a x80, I had a 32-bit 30, machine that was SMP with two sockets. <laughs> and it found so many bugs. And I loved that machine until finally um, the, hard or the power supply went and fried the board. But before that, it, it was like my best test machine because I found all the bugs that were actually real bugs. So. Well, and if, if, it, if it's upstream hardware, you could add a config that says, I need this config. And it's, nobody will probably ever run it other than you, but at least it's like captured. And, you know, I mean, like I showed on the K, on the, the kernel CI page, they do have a lot of SOCs, and so uh, if if it's a really rare piece of hardware, you probably can afford to run those tests anytime somebody updates it. Yeah. Don't hit the artist while he's while he's drawing my picture. It took a perfect bounce right to me. Thanks. Put a nice little splash Yeah. Um, also, if you have obscure hardware, kernel CI is set up to have distributed labs, so we can also help you set up a lab with your obscure piece of hardware, and you can get tr triggered and run jobs on your obscure hardware. It kind of goes to your point too, actually. I think a little bit. Yeah. But um, from what I've seen, so this is lava based, or is there also other um, mechanisms involved? Several of the several of the labs do run lava, but it's set up. I mean, it's an API. It's just it's it's easy if you have a lava lab. If it's not, you run a bit of glue lab type, and and we can help you set that up. Anyone else? Okay, well, we have a few minutes. Should I go through how to write a case self test? Yes, no? Okay, I got a thumbs up. I'll trust KP. All right, uh, yeah, how to write a case self test. Um, pretty simple. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it uh, has a config file that not everybody uses, uh, but the config file is supposed to show the, the K config options that you need to run the test suite. Um, one issue right off the bat there, I would say, is that you may want test cases that need config options that others don't, or vice versa, something to improve potentially. And then a make file that contains recipes for compiling the test cases, and then uh, indicating to the to the root make file uh, what, what they should run. So here's an example. Um, this is the uh, live patch config. Uh, obviously, you need live patch to be compiled into the kernel to run it. You need to uh, run test live patch so that it compiles all the uh, the modules that, that have the patches themselves, and um, it needs dynamic debug. Okay. Um, by the way, BAT is a really great tool if nobody's ever used it. It's like a nice way to render files um, that's sort of like CAP, but more fancy. Um, and then here's the make file on the right side. You have test progs, which tell the um, tell the, the make file and the uh, the self test root root directory root uh, what they should include for your suite, and when you install, it'll it'll include them. Um, and so here's an example of compiling, or rather installing, the, uh, the live patch target. Um, you just run, you tell make to look in the, uh, the self-test directory, you install, and you tell it which targets you want to build. Um, when you do that, it will create this case self-test install directory, which has uh, run case self-test.sh. Self um, and uh, if you look at, and then a list of, uh, a text file that includes a list of all the, the patches, or excuse me, the test cases that you want to run. And so if you included multiple targets here, obviously uh, there would be more subdirectories. 
Um, and uh, more test cases in here, uh, which is great. Um, fair warning that not every, uh, not every um, uh, suite is actually able to compile. So this kind of goes back also to the stability thing. Uh, not every suite is able to compile by default. You need to include dependencies depending on what you're compiling. Like for example, um, the, uh, the, uh, the VM suite, which is a really great uh, test suite for, for a lot of the memory manager, needs uh, libcap uh, dev. Um, and all the other test suites need that. Ha many of the other ones have their own requirements. This is another deficiency. You should be able to express requirements. Um, don't know exactly how that would work if you need like shared objects that are particular to some distro or some, you know, um, some setup. Um, for example, like I was talking about uh, having self-test for, for IOU ring, but if you need lib U ring, how do you express that? Right now you can't. Unclear how we would address that, but something to consider. Okay, so anyways, moving on. Uh, this is how you run uh, the self-test once they've been installed. You go to K self-test install, uh, and then you run the, the self-test. We saw this in an earlier slide, um, and that's it. Yeah, super simple. Um, if you want to add you know, more complex build stuff, it's really similar. I would look at the C group, uh, C group approach, um, and honestly, any of the other ones, they all do things a little bit differently. So just copy, copy pasta works well for K self-test. And yeah, that's it. Okay.